Voyager 1 and 2 were launched in 1977, some 16 days apart. Initially designed to study the gas giants of our solar system, both were hugely successful and their missions were extended to study the outer reaches of the solar system, and they have now been operating for over 40 years. Both were sent in different directions to explore what lies beyond our solar system. Back in 2012, Voyager 1 crossed the boundary of the heliopause. On the 5th of November 2018, Voyager 2 officially crossed its boundary as well. What can the data from both of these probes reveal about the structure of our solar system and what lies beyond it? Getting these probes this far is a miracle in itself. They are both powered by a device called a radioisotope thermal generator, and this decreases in power by 4 watts per year. So in order to make this mission last longer, they've had to turn off the majority of the other cameras and other sensors on the crafts. Voyager 2 is now over 11 billion miles from Earth and it now takes 16 and a half hours for the messages sent from Voyager to be received on Earth. We know that the Sun gives out a constant stream of charged particles that we call the solar wind, and these create a bubble around the Sun. It is theorised that outside of this there is a galactic wind which pushes back on the bubble, creating a sort of cometary tail behind the Sun. But this notion of a tail has since been called into question by the data from IBEX and the Cassini mission in conjunction with the Voyager data which reveals that the solar system creates a spherical bubble, not a comet tail. Cassini has an instrument which can measure the effect of charged particles at boundaries such as the heliopause. Now this was initially used to study Saturn, but they realised that it could also be used to measure the same effect in the heliopause. As the Sun's activity changes over an 11 year cycle, the amount of charged particles streaming out changes as well. If the heliopause is comet shaped, then the particles from the tail side would take longer to reach the boundary. What they discovered was that there was no difference between the front side and the tail side, implying that the heliopause is spherical. It also revealed that the magnetic field surrounding the solar system was much stronger than first thought. So what can Voyager 2 reveal in its crossing of the boundary? Firstly, when examining the distances for Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 crossing this boundary, it indeed confirms a spherical bubble shape. Now I find it odd how scientists in many of the recent papers still refer to the comet tail phenomena, when the Ibex and the Cassini data clearly refutes this. What is interesting is that as Voyager 2 passed through the boundary, they saw a steady drop in the solar wind speed. This boundary was not a sharp line, as it took 80 days for Voyager 2 to cross it, compared to only one day for Voyager 1. In the case of Voyager 1, this boundary was much sharper, and it was able to detect cosmic rays almost immediately and no more solar wind. In Voyager 2's case, it was a steady decrease in the solar wind and a steady increase in the cosmic rays, and this suggests that there is some leakage both ways across this boundary. The difference between Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 may be accounted for by the fact that Voyager 1 crossed at solar maximum and Voyager 2 crossed at solar minimum. Voyager 2 also still has a working plasma science experiment on board, Sadly, the one on Voyager 1 failed a long time ago and did not provide any data for its crossing. For Voyager 2, it revealed that until recently, the space surrounding Voyager 2 was filled with plasma flowing outwards from the Sun. They were able to detect the speed, density, temperature, pressure and flux of this plasma. And on the 5th of November, it saw a steep decline in the speed of this plasma and a steep rise in the galactic cosmic rays. Its measurements of the interstellar magnetic field are also intriguing. Before Voyager 1's 2012 crossing, the scientists expected to see a significant difference 
in the direction of the magnetic field outside the heliopause compared to inside. Voyager 1 found that the interstellar field was largely aligned with the heliospheric field, and it was confirmed by Voyager 2 as well. This is a mystery to most scientists as there is no clear mechanism for why these two fields should be aligned. So what can we read into this data in terms of plasma and electric universe concepts? The first point is it is safe to assume that we are not part of an hourglass structure where the sun is at a pinch point. This doesn't mean that it didn't form like this, but that structure is long gone. We are left with a spherical bubble around the sun. The fact that the magnetic field of the heliopause aligns with the galactic field, I think is significant. If we are part of a large stellar Birkeland current, then this would have an overall magnetic field direction, and it would seem logical that any star system that forms would naturally align to this. The question is, in which direction is this flowing? If we look at the magnetic field and the direction the solar system is moving in, then it is clear that they do not align. Looking at the motion of the gas clouds surrounding the solar system, they seem to be travelling at 90 degrees to our direction of travel. It is very hard to find images that bring all of these aspects together. Looking at the data from Voyager 1, it would appear that the low energy plasma particles simply dropped. At the same time, a separate instrument measured a significant increase in the high energy cosmic particles. This makes sense as outside of this bubble, the magnetic field strength probably would drop as we cross the boundary. Yet, if we are part of a large Birkeland current, shouldn't we detect charged particles in the opposite direction here? If there is a double layer surrounding the sun, then there would be a region where the particle count would be almost zero. Sadly, there is no electric field detector on Voyager to detect this change in the field. The question is, would that have affected the electronics in the craft? And then that comes to the question, how well shielded are those electronics to protect it from that? It's a big unknown. If this is the case, then we would expect to see the particle count rise once it passes through this central region. Now our working assumption is that the sun is driven by a current coming into and out of the poles. If this is the case, then we would expect that charge density would be greatest in these regions, and therefore it is possible that the area where Voyager 1 and 2 are is simply outside of the incoming Birkeland current. Assuming that our star is part of a larger filament, this then raises the question about how this might be structured. In most diagrams you see of Birkeland currents, they are shown as huge tubes with counter-rotating shells. The reality might be more complex and yet more organic. The stars are indeed strung along with winding filaments, which are in turn wound in larger structures. But is it possible that the current carrying part is but a very small fraction of the total volume? I think there's a lot more to be gained from the data in the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 craft. So I think this is something that we will have to come back to once we can fit more of these pieces together. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.